become impoverished as a people every time we become very mechanical about what we do. I live in California. If I go to a restaurant, some real cute surfer will come mincing up to my table and say, hi, everybody having a great evening. My name is Jason. What can I do for you this evening? And he says it just like that. At every table, he has a mechanical way of being awfully charming, and it isn't real. You know that thing? Or maybe you know preachers who get up and they very mechanically give you their homily, their sermon, whatever it is, and there's no juice and passion in there because they're on automatic pilot. Or maybe you hear the politician giving his speech and he knows just exactly where and how to raise his voice and shout and accent this syllable over that syllable. And there's a part of you that says, this guy's not real. I don't believe him. Or maybe you get up every morning and you do your routine work in a very mechanical way. You rinse out the dishes. You put them in the dishwasher. You let the machine do the work for you. You really try as little as possible to get your hands wet because, you know, you, you're going out in a minute and you have to look good and you try not to really clean the floor too well. You take a, a cloth and with your foot you sort of rub it around there, but you don't get on all fours and get into this job. And you sort of go about doing all your daily tasks in a kind of a distant mechanical way. One day you might decide, that's it, the bathroom really needs a good scrub and no one's going to do it the way I do it. And you put on all your old clothes and you fill a bucket with hot, soapy, sudsy water and you get a brush and you get down on all fours and you scrub the heck out of all those tiles and into the corners and you rinse and you wipe and you sort of stand back and say, fabulous. And you really feel good. You know that really good feeling that comes when you've done a fine job of cleaning something? You might even smile and go into the living room and someone say, you're looking like you had a good day. Did you have a good day? I did. I had a religious experience. No. I cleaned the bathroom floor. In fact, when we get into it, those are our religious experiences. But when we stay distant from it, we deprive ourselves of religious experiences. When we allow work to become drudgery, then it's automatic. But when we turn it into a work of art, it feeds us back. Are you doing your taxes? Do you hate it? And at the same time, when you've got certain things all lined up and you did it right, do you feel great? That's how close drudgery and a work of art live. That's how close. St. Teresa of Avila said, when we drag our cross, it's heavy. But when we embrace it, it's light. And every task that we have that bugs the heck out of us and that we sort of put off and that we hope we can sort of get by with just sort of doing a superficial something with bugs us. Neurosis is a heavy cross. But awareness makes it light. Take it on, embrace it with your heart and soul, and you will feel great. Embrace it with your heart and soul, and it will bless you back. It's an odd thing to know. Wouldn't it be great if we could turn all our drudgery into a work of art? Hi, I'm Monsignor Walter Nolan. Welcome to the Catholic Corner. You were just listening to Gertrude Mueller Nelson. Gertrude's the author of many, many books, among them, To Dance with God and Dwell Free. 
Stories to Heal the Wounded Feminine. In addition to be a noted author, Gertrude's also an illustrator, a teacher, an artist, a mystic, and a mother. And maybe the mother blends all of them all together. She visited my parish, St. Paul's in Princeton, to give a parish mission. Our pastoral associate, Jen Hinton, had a chance to talk with Gertrude for the Catholic Corner and to ask her about her life and her ministries. Let us go to that interview now. Gertrude, we are so pleased here at St. Paul's Church to have you for our parish mission. And also, I understand it's your first time to New Jersey, so we're very mm -hmm. honored. And I know in my introductions, I have introduced you as so many different things. You are a teacher, an artist, an author, and an illustrator. Tell me about each of these gifts. And did you discover them all at once, or did one <laughs> gift reveal another? Well, I think I would call myself a Jill of all trades and a master of nothing. Um, I think I'm still just doing what I did as a kid, mm -hmm. except that as I grow up, it grows up. All my life I drew, and that was something we did in our household. We made things. And we drew, and we whittled, and we carved, and, and we wrote stories, and we wrote plays, and, and both my parents were teachers, and all my siblings are teachers. So Maybe talk a little bit about your, your parents and uh, their journey here, and how they helped you understand what your gifts were. I'm very grateful, in fact, to my parents and for how I was raised. I had parents who were pretty much ahead of their times. We came from Germany just during the Hitler threat, and my parents knew that it was right that we leave. So I was barely born, and they picked me up and picked up my two older sisters, and we went to the United States. And my father was a professor. And my mother began to write uh, immediately with this brand new language of hers about liturgy at home, about celebrating at home as a family, about the domestic church, if you will. And she brought with her a wealth of our European customs and uh, ceremonies and rituals and so on, and she began to share those. And the first thing was a very small booklet called Family Life in Christ, which was published by Liturgical Press, and which became a classic. And I don't know how a pamphlet can become a classic, but it did. It touched people just exactly where they needed to be, and my mom was the first lay person, never mind, first woman, to speak at the National Liturgical Conference, which had hundreds and hundreds of priests and bishops and so on, and she was the only lay person speaking about the sacrament of baptism, speaking about the sacrament of marriage, um, speaking about the family and life at home, and how the church needs to permeate family life and how the family in turn needs to bring home the, the richness of the church. And certainly I would think of the book that you lit, wrote later, yes. The Two Dance with God, as being a classic in just that same way, so following in your, in your mother's footsteps in yeah, some way. Yeah, it could be. Um, and that's certainly the way I first met you, was yes. by chance or the grace of God ordering that book and it's been a companion and, and as I said you have been a companion it through that book to me and my family growing up over the last 20 years. Talk a little bit about this book To Dance with God. Um, one of your many books, some of them are, have been written for children and some for adults. Um, how did the title come out about? Well the title came from one of my kids. My children are my spiritual directors in some way. Um, Anika, my youngest, was I think four years old, when she started pulling things out of the wastebasket, which I was throwing away from a sewing project I was concentrating on, and she was pulling out these long strips of colored fabric and trotting off with them. And when it grew very quiet, I was suspicious. So I stopped my work and I tracked bits of fabric mm -hmm. out of the house and into the back garden. There was Anika with all the scotch tape dispensers lined up one broom handle and the long bits of fabric and these she had wadded on to the end of the stick with lots of tape 
And I asked the kind of dumb questions parents ask. I said, Anika, what are you doing? And she said, I am making a precession. We need a precession so that God will come down and dance with us. <laughs> Wonderful. And with that, she lifted up her stick and let the wind blow the scraps of fabric. And slowly, she began to dance. That's great. That's a great story. And I, I, one of the books that you wrote for children, that you've written for children, was done with Anika. Yes, uh, that's right. She's an illustrator now. She was always pulling things out of wastebaskets and making <laughs> them. So, uh, yes, in our household, in turn, we also were always making things. Um, but that little comment of Anika's and, and so many more like that, that children everywhere make until they're about seven or eight and begin that process that's the human condition of a loss of a certain innocence. They have such an easy way with God. All you need is a broom handle, what your mother throws away, and you've got God as a partner in a dance. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why is it so easy for them? And why, as we grow older, we get more complicated and God is more distant, and we would never think for five minutes that God would be an equal partner in a dance. And then I think, well, that's the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening. That's the way it was before the fall and before our individual falls from innocence, when we have to start eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and when we have to start making decisions about this is good and this is not good, and I have to do this and not do that. And then suddenly we're outside the garden wishing we could get back in. And you've wandered into many gardens. Um, certainly your family's given you a great sense of liturgy and spirituality and, yeah. and God, but also you have some interesting educational background. You went to the uh, Carl Jung Institute in uh, Zurich. I did. I, I, I got interested in, in Jung. Pretty early. When I was in college, I remember reading an article. I said, hey, this, this guy's for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I read a small book called Holiness is Wholeness. And it was the first time in all my Catholic education that I read something that said, it did not say holiness is perfection. Holiness is goodness. Holiness is only doing the right thing. It said holiness is wholeness, and to be whole. We're a little bit of everything. And that meant becoming friends with that part of ourselves which we deny mm -hmm. and which we repress, and which, unfortunately, we then project on other people. So holiness is getting in touch with all that stuff which we would like not to take responsibility for. So saints weren't perfect. Saints were in touch with their wholeness. That was revelatory for me. Mm -hmm. it made me seek out Jung, but it wasn't until I was married and had three kids before I actually went to Zurich and took some courses in Jungian psychology, which is centered around our religious issues. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, those themes come out, and such a beautiful blend that you put in your books um, of that the holiness and the wholeness. And another theme that I'd like you to talk about, we talk about finding that holiness or that wholeness in ordinary things. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, the other thing I seem to have learned in the process of my spiritual development that so much, we don't ascend Mount Carmel anymore our religious experience, there has been a paradigm shift. And so much of our spirituality is about who's on top and who's up high and how do you get high. It ain't so anymore. It's about the God under our feet. It's about the holiness of this earth. It's about the holy in the very ordinary stuff. Because if you look at what the church gives us, when it comes right down to it, the church gives us bread and wine and ashes and water and oil and tears, fire, all the things that are part of our everyday lives and puts a circle around it and says, this is the holy stuff. And by encircling it, we have made it more conscious, more holy, and we're supposed to take care of this. 
So many religious experiences, I think, come from the ground up rather than from the top down. And we keep looking in wrong places and wondering why nothing happens. And that's a great point. And I would ask, you know, to share your wisdom on for families today who need so much to find holiness in the ordinary things they do, the busy lives they have. Yes. What would you, if you could just share some words with families, say, having raised a family of your own, um, you know, what would you say to them about that? Well, first of all, children need to be educated in nature. I think children today are nature deprived. They sit in front of the TV and they sit in front of their computers and they sit in school mm -hmm. and a real oneness of, with nature it, it, it is lacking. It's like a vitamin that's missing. Mm -hmm. I can remember a, a, a school that was all concerned because the children were supposed to be playing on the blacktop in the back, yeah, in the, in the back playground, mm -hmm. but they weren't. They had gone along the edge where the dirt was and the angleworms had come up and they were all on their tummies lying there playing with the angleworms. And the teachers were upset because they were getting dirty and they were playing with angleworms. And I said, hold it. Rejoice and be glad because <laughs> they're in touch with the earth. Mm -hmm. And we have blacktop between us and the holiness of this earth far too much. Mm -hmm. And then I gave them a little thing on the holiness of these things. So first of all, raise your children with lots of nature. And when there are chores to do, turn them into a a conscious experience, not a you got to experience, because neuroses is a kind of religious experience. It keeps the devil at bay, so to speak. But to be aware mm -hmm. and to take an ordinary job and do it with full awareness, a kind of Zen experience of washing the dishes or scrubbing around the toilet mm -hmm. or digging over the garden, or it always has to do with water and fire and earth. Simple things. I remember someone sharing a thought about washing dishes as if it were a baby Buddha. <laughs> I thought that was taking it really into a great yes. a spiritual realm. You know, we, we um, again, as I said, we're so blessed to have you here, also because it's the first time, I think, in, in recent times at St. Paul's that we've had a lay woman um, speak at a yes. mission, and I think that's been a very interesting and new experience for a lot of people here. Um, speak to that a little bit. How do you, what do you see the role of, of the lady? I mean, oh, developing, heavens. going forward, lay women in church, where, you know? <laughs> well, when I was baptized, or when you were baptized, mm -hmm. we were baptized as priest, prophet, and king. Mm -hmm. Priest, prophet, and king, and we do not take seriously the priesthood of the laity. It's not the same priesthood, as the ordained priesthood, but it's a serious one. And to make too great a separation between those two is to rob the laity of a responsibility and a holiness which is in their hands and which was given to them in baptism. I like that, that talking about not only the privilege, but the responsibility, the responsibility yeah. of, of moving forward in church. That's right. What do you, what do you how well, do you see, see the church in 10, 20 years? Well, what, I, any thoughts? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, I think we still have a great tendency to come into church and plunk down into a pew and sit back and hope that the priest will cough up a religious experience for us. Mm -hmm. That's over. doesn't happen anymore. Sorry. We bring to church and offer in the offertory the religious experiences of our week. And when we are sent forth, we are sent forth to love and serve the Lord, which means those religious experiences will come in the actions of the week, in our interactions with family and co-workers. And that's hard work. But that's where the religious experience is, and this is what we then bring back. The prepared and open mind is the only mind that can receive the Word of God. So we can't come in all closed up and ready for somebody else to do it for us. Gertrude, you talked um, earlier about um, how important it is for families to, uh, to be in touch with nature and, and bring nature into their family life. Um, how would you say that the seasons of nature and the church year provide a framework for women's lives? Well. We have spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And in the liturgical year, we have this spring. Lent is the 
lengthening of the light. Lent means spring. And it, and it is truly glorious in the springing up from the grave of Christ in the resurrection. So we have a spring, we have a summer where all the fruits of the earth come forth and where we celebrate, in fact, Feast of the Blessed Virgin on the Feast of the Assumption, which is a way of saying, look, the earth and the heaven are one. They're one piece. And it's been a tradition to bring the fruits of the earth to the church to be blessed in gratitude and to share with those who don't have. Then you have autumn, a falling of leaves, a kind of dying. It looks like dying. And then comes winter. You swear it's dead, but we're celebrating a pregnancy. Under the ground, the roots are still growing. Everything is lying fallow and waiting. And waiting is one of those feminine values that we try to blast away in our lives. So the church follows the natural seasons of the year. And we people also have those natural seasons in the year. And the church, in uh, her love for us, cares about the seasons of our becoming, cares about those times when we have to lie fallow and wait for the new thing to happen, wait for the poem to come to us, wait for the right job to materialize, wait for our relationships to begin to come to birth, waiting. It's there. It tells us all the seasons of waiting in your life, which don't necessarily match perfectly mm -hmm. with Advent, for instance, or with the winter time. they are holy. Whether you're waiting for the paint to dry or for the green light to come on uh, in traffic, waiting is holy. And then you've got uh, the, 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 the springtime of new life. We do have bursts in our lives and in our psyches and in our souls where all of a sudden an idea comes to us, all of a sudden something comes to bloom, all of a sudden the work that we're doing seems to click and come together, and we are raised to a new life. All those seasons are important to us. That's a great advice, waiting, and a hard thing to do today with families, you know, rushing around in cars, and as you said, you know, TV screens and things like that going all the time. You've talked in the last couple of days about, you know, openness and receptivity, mm -hmm. and also the feminine, masculine natures mm -hmm. that we all have. Mm -hmm. So um, rather than asking, you know, what do you see as the role of lay women or lay men, mm -hmm. what do you think would be a message for us to get in touch with both sides of those things? Well, that's, I think, what has to happen. I think the women's liberation was a kind of a mass movement not to be plunked into one cubbyhole and told that women have to be pretty, cook well, and make nice bouquets for the table when the boss comes, but to be whole and to be in touch also with their masculine side, which women desperately need because it's what gives order and it gets things done. Mm -hmm. Okay, But a man has a feminine side. And men have projected that onto women to carry. And women say, enough. Don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And the men are slowly beginning to say, oh, which means you can't project the whole your masculine on us, which means we don't have to be the only ones who change tires or go to work or provide for our families. Men and women have masculine and feminine within them, and they have to get a right relationship become whole and uh, holy. And that's kind of what's happening in this world right now. We're new at it. It's a new development in consciousness. And it's hard work and it's dangerous because we could misfire. You know, I'm thinking that too when you talk about a new consciousness, um, 
you also then start out entering into realms in terms like mysticism. And I know that mm. you have been called a true mystic, you know, the, oh, yes. the wise sister. Um, <laughs> speak to that a little bit. And maybe even are there are any of our mystics that have gone before us that are a particular inspiration to you? Well, I was named after a mystic. Mm -hmm. Both of my sisters were named after mystics. Um, oh, I, I would reject being called a mystic. I'm, I'm still on the road. In whatever form um, our becoming whole takes, I don't know what name you would give it. But I would see some of the mystics, for instance, Hildegard of Bingen as being one of those people who, who, could, who could write about the eating of an apple and how it cleans your teeth, or who could discover certain grains that were good for you, who, who cared about the healing of the body, mm -hmm. as well as writing music and musicals and miracle plays. And you know, she was certainly a Jill of all trades. Mm -hmm. um, is that what a mystic is? I don't know, maybe. Maybe it's being able to write down your conversation with God. As so many other mystics did. I haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Gertrude, I can't thank you enough for the time you've spent here in St. Paul's, and certainly um, I've enjoyed the conversations that you have written down in your books, um, To Dance with God and Hear All Dwell Free, and uh, I look forward to sharing those with my daughters and, and my son as they, as they grow and, and start families. And, um, Truly, I think you have brought us some wholeness and uh, some joy in our ordinary lives these days. So I thank well, you so much. Well, it's been an honor to be here, an honor. And thank you for inviting sure. me. <laughs> Gertrude invites the mystic and all of us to come forth and to share that great mystery of the Trinity. You know, she thanked us and we thank her for giving us so much of an insight into our wholeness and especially maybe into the quietness that God asks us to have sometimes and to find him in those special moments with family. As Gertrude mentioned, Carl Jung, I'm always reminded of the time he was asked, did he believe in God? And he said, no, that he knew God. It's really in the knowing God in the present moment, in the quiet, and in the family, and in the blessings. The Catholic Corner, thanks for being with us. Please be in touch. Post Office Box 5147, Trenton, New Jersey, 08638. We'd love to hear from you, 609 406-7402. And remember, we all are asked to pray with our God, to be present to our God, and to share the mysticism of his Son.